Hello everybody and welcome to a new episode of Revit Pure Life. I am your host, Nicolas Quetelier. I am an architect and BIM specialist based in very cold and very snowy Quebec City today. Uh, we had temperature of minus 30 degrees Celsius yesterday, so coldest time of the year. would be curious to know where you are watching this show from and what kind of temperature you've got at home right now. Uh, we've got a great show for you today. Before moving on with our guest, a few things to talk about. Uh, first, if you're new to uh, Revit Pure, you can have a look at our courses at learn.revitpure.com. We've released three courses so far. One is for BIM Manager. It was released last September. Um, <clears throat> it is called Revit the Manage Learning Package. We have a course that is aimed to help people use graphic for uh, design and presentation views that is called design. And finally, for beginners, we have our basics course. So you can have a look at learn.revitpure.com. Uh, something else, a follow-up to the last week episode with Bill Carney, uh, in which he presented scripts, Dynamo scripts, to automate some tasks uh, for interior design. And I promised I would create a post with some of these scripts but I had to go through them. Some of them uh, had expired nodes, so I had to, uh, um, with the help of Bill, make a few updates and put in some instructions. So you can go to the Revit Pure blog and the latest post is, or if you're watching later on, just type this on Google, three Dynamo scripts to automate the interior design in Revit. And you can download these three scripts. The first one is to create families along the room boundaries. <clears throat> Uh, the second one takes data from the room schedule, the floor finish, and will create a different finish on each room. And it will also create types, create floor types if they don't already exist in the project. And finally, the last scripts will automatically, automatically place wall protections like this, as well as door signage that automatically takes the data from uh, the room and place it inside the sign. So the door, the room number and uh, the room name. Great scripts, they, you can download them all for free at this URL and they were all made uh, by Bill Carney. So thanks, Bill. Uh, before moving on as well, uh, next episode, next week with John Pearson, which who is actually a colleague of uh, today's guest. Uh, Pretty funny coincidence. And John Pearson is very well known in the Dynamo community. He's the creator of the Rhythm package for Revit and the Monocle package uh, as well. And the name of the episode is Optimizing Dynamo. Uh, so that's one not to miss. Oh, he's actually in the chat as 60 second Revit. So hello, John. And hi, everybody in the chat as well as people from Dallas, Calgary, Southern California, New Orleans, Barcelona, uh, Dallas, uh, and Dublin, South Jersey. People all around the world as usual. Some people with better weather than here. You know, you know what, although I, I like snow, you know, I've got to do some uh, winter sports. All right. So today's guest is Melissa Thiessen. She's a design technology specialist at Parallax Team. She graduated with a degree in architecture from the University of Utah in 2003. Before becoming a BIM consultant, she worked as a BIM manager for close to 15 years at GSBS Architects. She has presented at multiple BIM conferences, including Autodesk University and BILT. So welcome to the show, Melissa. Hello. All right, let me just drink a little bit of water. So how are you doing? I'm doing all right. Um, well, we were chatting a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. I had my run in with the COVID, mm -hmm. um, but vertical, so things are things are OK. Yeah, well, thanks for making it to the show, even though you, you've you got the, this COVID thing. <laughs> just um, got the plague, it's fine. <laughs> Yeah, you, you don't look too bad, although you, you've told me it's a, it's mostly a fatigue. So hopefully we'll, we'll make it through. If you're going to make it through, the, that's okay. Well, let me know and we'll adjust. <laughs> so if I need a nap in the middle. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I usually start with, with a question is, how did you get interested in BIM? Oh, isn't that the question? I think BIM becomes interested in you, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I'd always been kind of the software nerd. Um, I, I was known as the block queen for a little while at my office um, with the dynamic, dynamic blocks in AutoCAD. And then in 2000, I guess late 2005, we started really looking at Revit. Um, we've been kind of keeping an eye on it, but my boss didn't think it was quite ready for prime time. Yeah. So that's when it's, it was, I think it was 8.1 was the first one that we really tried some projects on. 8.1, so w what year was that? That was, that was 2005, 2006, before hmm. they jumped two years. And I'm sure somebody in the comments won't remember exactly. But. 2005, yeah. So you're, you're quite the veteran in the scene. Uh, yeah. So we got to jump into those, start a few projects. And <clears throat> I did originally get some training through our reseller. But because, um, because of the way things were going, we got the level one. And then I actually took... A project that we had been working on in AutoCAD and rebuilt it in Revit before the training too. And um, so by that training, it was a smaller group in my office. And I actually ended up answering a bunch of the questions for the trainer because I had already been poking around in it. Yeah. So, so, so I guess the trainers back then didn't really use the software so much, right? Yeah, I mean, he was kind of learning a couple of the things, you know, mm -hmm. just before we were. So I think I was hooked, hooked from then. Um, and I've just always found it so fun to try and figure out how to create all the different shapes and, you know, um, I had friends that would get annoyed, we'd be walking around or even my sister would tell me to shut up because I'd be like, oh, we can do this and, you know, use a railing for that and do this and, and muscle this this way and rub it. And, and so when did you start using it uh, actively in your office? Um, after our pilot projects, so I think it was probably early 2006 is when we had our, our first two pilot projects. And it was... I remember the first two official ones. We had a liquor store in Salt Lake City. And so that was kind of our small project. Mm -hmm. But it went really well. And they were they were really pleased with, you know, being able to go make changes live in the meetings and show them what it was that they wanted. And then we had a, a readiness center for the National Guard in North Salt Lake was our second. So that was our bigger project. Um, and originally the idea was to start with those two and then kind of, you know, train, train mm -hmm. a group of people and have them move on to other projects and then have it snowball. But once people started seeing what we were doing with our projects, nobody wanted to wait. So it, it went yeah, faster it, than we thought. It went faster. But, yeah. Yeah. Everybody was, everyone was really excited to get interrupted. Yeah. Well, it's, it's. It's wow. a little funny to hear that uh, in 2005 you were doing this transition. I'm still uh, helping some firms that are still using Autogad, so are basically at the same step that you were <laughs> 17 years ago. Yeah. So I, I mean, most firms, I think, large firm it, it made the move, but some, the more reluctant one, are still at that step. <clears throat> yeah, and that it does kind of blow my mind considering how long some of us have been at it. Uh, but it is, it can be a really big, big change. Good one, I think. Yeah, uh, Scour DX in the chat mentioned that, that a lot of people were learning the software during the 2008 mm -hmm. uh, financial uh, crisis. It's true, usually it's true that at that time that there might have been a small, a bigger burst of uh, usage of, uh, of Revit and BIM. All right. So uh, recently, I think in two uh, two years ago now, or about something like that, you you've moved to a team parallax. So you've yeah. decided to uh, 
um, quit your job as a BIM manager for an architect firm and move on to become a BIM consultant. So can you tell me about it? What motivated you to make that change? Well, clearly I just wanted to get ahead of the curve and start working from home, like two whole months before COVID made everyone else work from home. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I think it was, it was just time. I, I love my old firm. We got to do some really awesome stuff. Um, but there's, I think a lot of current bid managers and people kind of in our position will, will know the feeling that when you're in a firm, you've, there's the bonus of you, you're in a day to day, you know what the issues are, but you're also the person that sits on the desk next to them. So there's, there's a lot of, you're trying to make things better for everyone, but at the same time, you're kind of taken for granted because you're always there to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's yeah. kind of one of those problems where it's it's awesome to be there. It's awesome to be working with the people and having the day-to-day -day issues to fix. Uh, well, really, it's better because you can kind of proactively see these things before they become problems. Yep. So it's, it's kind of upsides and downsides. Um, and uh, what kind of projects or what is your role has been uh, at Parallax since uh, you've joined? Um, most of the stuff we've been doing since I joined has been um, template rollouts. Um, and I've been helping, Aaron's been doing training classes. I've been going through those um, and adding closed captioning things. Um, but it's been pretty cool. We've worked with a bunch of all sorts of different sizes. You know, we've got a couple of small clients where there's just a handful of them and they're coming for a whole new template and everything. And then we've got big companies coming where, you know, they've got hundreds of employees all over the place, but they just want a template that's been kind of vetted and a lot of the pieces already figured out. Yeah. And you're, you're not a big team, right? In a, at Parallax, unless I'm missing something. There's only a few of you, unless there are people behind the scenes. Oh, there's a lot of people behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah. No, that, yeah, there's five of us. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's what I thought. And so Aaron and I are mostly the ones doing the template because John's obviously got all sorts of dining goodness to do. Um, and Lauren has been working on getting her stuff out. Um, yeah, I've, uh, I've had uh, Lauren on your on the show uh, mm -hmm. a few months ago. Yeah, so she's she's been working really hard on the foreground stuff and getting more of a landscape template going. Which is exciting because we had landscape at my old firm and yeah, every time somebody would say, well, we want them in Revit, it was like, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. landscape is a challenge. Yeah, it is. Like, but, I would love it too, but I don't want to force them to use a tool that's just not ready for them. So. Yeah, but both episodes I did about landscape turned out to be uh, among the most popular. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely feel like they, they, they've been waiting. They've been waiting their turn. <laughs> They're ready to be able to play with the, the fun 3D stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the, Parallax, I, I guess it's Aaron uh, as Team Parallax on the YouTube that says, I think 60% of the company is listening to the show and 20% is on maternity leave. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. All right, so do you want me, I can uh, share your screen. With, with the public, do you have a couple of things to uh, to show us? Things you've been uh, working on? Um, yeah, this was just one of this was actually the first thing I was working on with Aaron when I race when I first started. Um, um, and this was this is a kind of a cool one. It's different than doing the template stuff, but it was what Aaron calls reconciliation modeling. Mm -hmm. And basically, what we do is we take the PDF, like the actual CD drawing set. We don't get anybody's models. We get the PDFs that were sent to the contractor and we we build this model. Um, so these are obviously just some pretty pictures because everybody loves to see pretty BIM, BIM images. Um, but this one, it was this was the first one I had worked on with Aaron and I think I know that time is always the crunch in 
in firms, but when you get new intern architects starting, if you could literally give them a project, give them the full set of CDs and put them in a room for a month and just let them try and build that project, I think they would learn so much more um, because you, you get into the model and you've, you know, you've been in it, you've been modeling it, and then you get to the part where you're putting on some dimensions, but you, you feel like things make sense. But somebody who hasn't lived in this model for you know, eight months before it came out, they aren't going to know exactly where everything started from or where it came from. So a lot of the the trick in remodeling this was you would you would have a dimension for how big something was, but it wouldn't actually be located. So yes, we can you know measure in the PDFs and things, but we would basically have to send RFIs back to the design team to say, hey, this thing is this big, but it's kind of floating in space. Um, so we were doing a lot of that before the contractor was even getting to the point where they would be running into RFIs. Um, but it was it was very interesting running through um, and this project, you know, of course had an architect and an interior design firm and so there were a lot of places where the architect had a detail, the interior detail was slightly different. And so it was, it was interesting to go through that and just trying to build just straight from PDFs. Uh, we'll go through a couple of these. And in a, in a project like this, so when do you get uh, brought onto the project? Is it verily very early on or are you more brought in projects when it's there are problems arising <laughs> well i hope though with this one it was um the contractor oh the contractor okay yeah yeah um and we've had a few reach out from like developer side um, so the faster well with with everything then the earlier you can get started with some of these things the more benefit you'll see um, and the more things that we're able to just catch and talk to the design team and get an answer on before you know there's a guy with the concrete truck being on site um, yeah i we've got a another former guest of the show uh the rivet geek <laughs> aka brian mckee that says we used to make teams go out and physically lay out their project from the pdf they realize how terrible they were for contractors. <laughs> yeah, that, no, that's a good one. I actually had my first boss, my first architect boss, when I was still in school. Um, we we had done a small, I think it was, what was it? Just a small school, um, and it was CMU. And we went out there, and he took us. He took me and one of my the fellow student that were working for him and we went out there and he let the mason yell at us because there were two doors in the gym area that were you know this far apart mm -hmm. and it's block so yeah yeah <laughs> you got to hey, the, yeah cut, cut the little block yeah <laughs> yep. you got to yell at us for what the heck were you thinking why are these doors this far why do i have to cut every single thing into little three inch chunks yeah, I, I remember my fr the first time I went on, on a side job when I was still an intern. It's pretty intimidating. You're, you're supposed to be there and tell them what to do when you have your little plan. But you've got these guys with like 30 years experience and mm -hmm. I'm freshly out of school and I'm supposed to tell them how they're supposed to build the, the building. <laughs> I was pretty scared. Yeah, and I'm sure they love that too. To <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. The interns. In intimidate, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they play around with, they mess with me a little bit. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Uh, all right. So, so what project was that? Um, this one was a hotel. Not sure how much I can say about it. I'm looking at the... oh, All right. All right. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can go to the next It's one, one of those kind of got put on hold because of, you know, the worldwide pandemic mm -hmm. projects. Um, so this next one, this, this is from a different project I just pulled out to kind of show some of the differences. So we're looking at the PDF, 
but you'll see there are different dimensions. So if you go into the actual model and get a dimension, you're getting 114 feet 6 and 19 128 is what's actually modeled versus what's rounded and what's dimensioned on the sheet. Um, and then you'll see that even on their documents, they're just calling out 114 foot 6. So I think a lot of times people think it's okay to just round, but obviously the poor guy on the site, <laughs> something's going to have to meet up somewhere at some point. Um, so this, this is probably what we would run into the most is something that is dimensioned in a detail or dimensioned on the plans. But when you actually go to try to model that using that detail, you miss, um, especially a lot with um, curtain wall and anything that is uh, radius, you'll, you'll tend to miss. So I think big lesson and it doesn't seem like something that should be i don't know a big surprise to anybody that you know when you're modeling something you should model it correctly and we shouldn't be fudging the dimensions like that's kind of defeats the whole point i mean in in real life obviously things are never going to be absolutely perfect well i shouldn't say never because robots are going to take over and do everything right. And then they will be perfect on the site. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Uh, I know that working with some clients, uh, I've been a consultant as well since March. And what I see, and that was the same at the office. Like we, like the models usually start pretty good not always the case, but then everything is fine and then suddenly the client makes a big change and then the people that are charged to make the changes might not be the most experienced and then that's when they start to mess thing around and round up values and use a lot of 2d techniques because yes it might save them time to have the pdf they need to have but then the model is kind of messed up and you have to work so hard to to put it back in as a high quality model yeah, it, it's sad because it seems like it almost always happens that way. Mm -hmm. It's like we all know that that's what's going on, but yeah, until we can get some actual decent timelines. Uh, we've got uh, James from New York who says hello, and Peep Peepska who says, "Can you make a plug-in to mildly electrical uh, users who round and override dimensions?" Oh. And then we've got John there saying yes. Yeah, yeah. Look for that, I guess. The the latest parallax <laughs> plugin will uh <laughs> that would be kind of funny. Although I'm thinking something more like the old um like what was it? Like the early day bad you'd send somebody an email that would say something like, Hey, I'm looking at you know, insert whatever you're not supposed to be looking at. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. It can be like, hey, I'm rounding dimensions over here. So <clears> somebody <throat> can go over and smack them. Well, uh, something a little similar to that, I had a show with uh, Parley Burnett from the Guardian plugin, and it's kind of that. Like, if you uh, <laughs> unpin elements you're not supposed to unpin, like, the, the plugin will prevent you from doing it, and it will send you an email telling you, hey, your BIM manager is really not happy with this, uh, <laughs> what you've tried to do. <laughs> so that, that that was pretty interesting. Uh, everybody seems to be excited about this uh, plugin yeah, idea. Everybody is liking the dog collar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, maybe we've just solved everything. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Um, All right, I'll let you keep uh, going. <laughs> um, um, so other thing, like, again, like, I don't feel like they're super mind blowing things that I've learned. But one thing that I will say to help all the other BIM managers out there that think they must be the only ones on the planet that don't have like a really nice Revit detail library. Oh man, that is such a just overarching like 
every firm has so many details that they've just been like carrying along and they've come from AutoCAD and some uh-huh. of them have been Revitize and some of them haven't and some of them end up being line work. Some of them have keynotes, some of them just have text. Everybody's got that. That that's I I think I was surprised but not surprised to find that because I know that I always felt like personal shame that you know we didn't have a perfectly wonderful beautiful uh, detail library that was completely vetted and everything was perfect and it was always mm-hmm. up to date i just i always felt like i was just failing in that but it seems to be one of the biggest questions we get asked is like and then details what do we do about our details <laughs> so yeah, well, uh, I Try see. To make uh, everyone else feel better out there. You're not alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I see Brian is there, and is, he has a great system, and he presented it on on the show, like to use only detailed components and uh, tag them, and then use no lines at all. Uh, but to, to me, I'll admit it's 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 still an ideal that I've I'm yet to reach with uh, uh, most clients. But I'm trying to, to push them there, but there's still a little bit of text and a little bit of. Uh, Uh, of lines left yeah it it does happen and the funny part to me is i thought maybe we were you know we we were special at my firm that we would get into all these deep discussions every time it was like okay we need to sit down decide what's in the detail library and the next thing you know we're we're rediscussing the point of a standard detail versus a common detail you know and it was like Mm -hmm. okay but we just need to know should we have this door threshold (laughs) (laughs) you have these architects waxing waxing poetic about everything Uh, and like very very good discussions but at the end of the day we still didn't know what we wanted to put into our detail library so everybody kept you know using what they had from before um, yeah, it's true that it's it's pretty much a mess, right? <laughs> yes. And I always try. Yeah, me too. I always try to make it better, but it 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 was all always a, a step forward and then two step back. <laughs> right? It was very slow progress to make it like the the perfect ideal I had in mind. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's another that's another problem we all have as pin managers, right? We all have these like we we saw the thing and we know that we can do this awesome whatever and everything's gonna be perfect when we just get that last thing done. And then and then time is a a real bugger and doesn't actually let you do any of those things. <laughs> yeah, and I know for for us it was all always as well. Like is it how much, like 2D versus 3D detailing, because in theory it's it's better if most you know you've got the most 3D information, so it's more accurate from the model. At the same time, it's much more easier to reuse if it's only 2D. Yep. So it it really depends. You have to think about it. There's not a single perfect way. That that was always a an issue as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think, well, even here at Parallax, um, we've, we've got a number of you know, libraries that we're starting. And so a detail component library is, is one of those things that I've been starting on. And then, of course, you know, every time I get into a certain thing, I have to, you know, go look up all the different types of chipboard that there are and all the, everything that I might mean, or I, everything that I might need. Uh, all the all the right thicknesses. I want to make sure that it's keynoting right, and I'm using the right lingo, and you know, so something that you look at and think, well, this should take, you know, an hour tops. You know, two two days later, you're on your third random. <laughs> Sorry, it's all <laughs> All uh, right. So having a little glance at the chat. <laughs> Uh, Tino says, uh, any ideas how to protect uh, proprietary details? Oh, I'm not sure about that. I don't know, because we've, we've seen uh, people put in like watermark type stuff. 
don't know. Yeah. At a certain point, I don't know if there's... So th there seems to be a pretty big uh, consensus that you uh, you should use live uh, live views for details. Everyone seems to be agreeing about that. Yeah, I guess. What about standard details, though? Yeah. See, and that 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 brings us right back to that thing. Mm -hmm. What is standard? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. right now we have um, our partition type details. So those are details that we have in the parallax uh, in our template. And they are, they're, they're not live details because they are drafted details of each of the partitions, but they are now using detail components and they are fully keynoted. So it's like baby steps. <laughs> Um, Great. So do you have a, a, a few more slides to show us? Oh, I didn't have any of those because they're just all types. But... Um, I, I don't know. Those are, they're so exciting and proprietary. I didn't even open any to show you. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, no problem. So do you have or more images or, or slides? Um, I did. There were a couple more. Oops. <clears throat> we, can, we can look at a couple other lovely images. Oh, there you go. James, that's, that's a good statement from James. <laughs> but the construction details shouldn't be considered proprietary. I don't know, James. What if you do win work because of your awesome details? I mean, I know you don't, but... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so what uh, this is the same project that you have uh, shown earlier so you made that work for the contractor yeah oh yep. yeah so this was this is just more images showing more of the um the models from the subs brought in so once we started getting mechanical stuff making sure all of their things worked making sure drainage was working on the pool deck um Aaron could probably tell hours and hours worth of stories of all the fun he had modeling the pool deck um, and the fact that he had three or four different drawings at any one time and they were all quite different as to what they were trying to go for there. Um, just, just more of the, the lovely eye wash. Yeah. So, big debate in the chat going on about I know, uh, I'm not detailing to keep <laughs> light, light in the flame. <clears throat> fight, fight, fight. <laughs> yeah, pr pretty good ideas about how to, uh, to, to protect your details. <laughs> and every idea that John comes up with is absolutely 1000% serious at all times. <laughs> and and so, so you've mentioned you've been doing a, a lot of templating. Do you usually start from a Parallax uh, standard template? Yeah, most of them. Um, usually we'll meet with the client and we'll look at what they've got and what their goals are first. Yeah. And so the idea will be if they don't need most of what we've got, maybe they've got a really good start, we can start moving some of our ideas into theirs. Um, a lot of the time they kind of want just kind of a fresh start, just to, you know, rip the bandaid off. And um, so we'll migrate 
some of their standard things, obviously text, line styles, um, try to get the look and feel mm -hmm. close to theirs. Um, but I, for the most part, it seems like we've been starting with ours and then kind of tweaking things. And the coolest part, I think, is every client that I've been able to work with so far has brought some sort of a really cool new idea that kind of ends up getting folded back into the template. So everybody's got, not to say they've only got one main idea, but you know, a lot of, a lot of templates and a lot of people over the years have kind of, we've all found things on the forums and we've all learned things at Built and at AU. And so there's always similar things. And then there'll be kind of this one, one-off thing that they're like, oh, but then we also threw this in our template. So ours keeps getting better by seeing all of these other templates and pulling information in from theirs. And then everybody um, kind of, everybody wins at that point because then they'll get a different version. And the next time we have somebody else come in, some of those cool ideas get folded in. And depending on how hard they are to push out, a lot of times we will send out files to prior clients and say, hey, here's this cool new idea. You can, you can put that into your template now too. <clears throat> what do you find to be the, the most challenging when you uh, create a new template for a client? What is the most difficult part? Hmm. It probably still is time. Time, yeah. uh, because you, you have you have these conversations with them and you have these great new ideas and you, you get them started but you know you you don't just have two months to run down that line and get it perfectly perfect before you need to get it out to the client because you know, they they need it they need to start running as well so I guess it is just a little bit more of the same. You you get cool ideas, you're excited to try some things, but you do have to deal with reality. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, for me, it's something I, I, found, I find to be challenging is that if let's, well, when they're starting with CAD, they might have a certain way of doing things, mm -hmm. but obviously you want to evolve it in Revit, but at the same time, you have to respect the, the way they're doing it. But if it doesn't make sense in Revit, obviously you you tell them and you teach them the the, the, the best way. <clears throat> but but to do so to do so in a way that is respectful of whatever standards they have. Yeah, it's it's always a little bit tricky, I find. Well, and I'm I'm sure everybody can guess we have the uh, the good old links versus uh, units or mm -hmm. links versus groups for units. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I saw Aaron talk, mm -hmm. talk about that with uh, on the Revit Kid. That, that, that was funny because I was debating that with a client of mine uh, recently as well. Yeah, and it still does come down to, like you said, kind of the standards, what they're used to. Um, so we we will go in and present you know, how we would do it, how we're comfortable with, and do what we can to help. But it does come down to you know, if, if nobody on their staff is going to be comfortable with it, they're going to need to do, they, they need to do it their way. They're going to be the ones that have to support it and keep it going. So we, we've talked about a whole bunch of different, um, I don't know what the right word is, bastardized versions, I guess, <laughs> just to try to kind of help people merge some of their current ways with um, better or different ways, yes. Yeah, sure. Uh, it, one one of the points I often see is uh, old schedules with uh, the, what I call the dot schedules that use um, mm. a symbol to indicate if something is uh, yes or no. And then there's a way to do it in Revit, but I'm like, yeah, that's it's a little complicated if you can use an easier technique, it would be better. But yeah. at the same time, I'm not trying to say, well, Revit cannot do it. It can, but it's it's a little bit cumbersome, a little bit more time. 
there's probably better ways but if the client insists well it's always possible yeah that's <laughs> that's definitely true we definitely have a lot of those conversations um where it is kind of a okay if this is this is the look you want or this is the way you want to be doing it it can be done these ways but it does mean you know somebody has to go through and check it or there might be a dynamo script that has to be run every mm -hmm. time um, so we do try to definitely leave that open um, but do let them know that they are they're losing time um, so even though yeah, as long yeah, I agree. As long as they know that they, they might lose a little bit of time, yeah. that's in in the end they're the one making the decision. Uh, uh, James uh, asks Melissa, "What about LOD? Any stories of implementing or complying with LOD requirements in the consulting world?" <laughs> <laughs> Everybody loves their LOD, don't they, James? <laughs> Well, obviously, we don't have any issues with our uh, level of detail or development or whatever other D word you want to think of. Um, we really haven't run into too much on the consulting side. Um, obviously, we take it to probably way over modeled in many people's points of view when we are following mm -hmm. things in-house. You tend to be on the higher side of uh, the, the LOD for most people. Yes. <laughs> and how much uh, in your work do you do you do paperwork? Because recently in the last five years has been this explosion of, I guess, what you could call the BIM bureaucracy of all the kind of standard ISO documentation and uh, the BIM execution plans and the LOD charts. How much of that have you been doing, if at all? So luckily for me personally, I haven't had to deal with that much on the parallel <laughs> side. I did have to create you know, a couple very lovely BIM execution documents at my mm -hmm. own firm um, and definitely went through the, the AIA documents quite a bit. Uh, working with consultants. So, but uh, not doing much of it at the moment? Yeah, but, but ask Aaron, he would probably tell you he does plenty of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've been, I've been trying to get my head into it in the, the, the last few months, but it's, uh, it's always a challenge to keep up. I've been trying to understand what's going on with the the ISO 196500 uh, norm, and it, it's quite something, honestly. Yeah, I can't say I'm looking forward to really diving into that. Yeah, I mean, either I was <laughs> like, yeah, I'm not sure if I want to become a specialist at that. Like, it's already to be a, a, a specialist. We have so much on our plate already, so, so yeah. much to learn. So I, I thought, well, I'm, I want to learn the minimum so I can at least talk about it with my clients but I certainly don't want to be the, the one filling this up uh, right. yeah, see we're getting much more LOD <laughs> <laughs> happening over there uh, LOD is a great topic uh, most drawing are overdeveloped talk to your contractor regarding LOD uh, interesting yeah. it I is think... hard yeah, good. it's difficult with the LOD because yeah, like people are saying manufacturers they obviously need something much different out of their model if they're like actually building pieces to manufacture their gizmo, um, and we just need something that maybe looks nice in our model or takes up the space so we can do you know, flash detection. Um, and all that's different from what the contractor wants or needs or even cares about. And yeah, we it's, it's a discussion we've had a lot at BCS so the Building Content Summit as well. Just mm -hmm. like going through all of those things, like what does the interior designer need versus what does the architect need versus what does the specifier need versus what does the buyer need? <laughs> and those can all be such different things. 
and yet we're kind of trying to cram them all into one one thing. So we're trying to put them all on one LOD level or yeah it, it's a big challenge and recently uh, i've seen more and more projects here requiring uh, big lod charts on excel spreadsheets and i i don't like them much <laughs> i find it's a kind of waste of it mm -hmm. <laughs> i don't enjoy i, I don't know i'm a bit curious uh, anyone in chat enjoys using lod charts i've or i've found them very useful i guess probably for the contracting side uh for contractors might be more helpful but um on the architecture side, uh, they, they honestly just mostly bother me. Yeah, it's just, it's like throwing a bunch more wrenches in mm -hmm. when you're just trying to do the thing and, and people are throwing in, well, it needs to be this and it needs to have that and I need to figure this out. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I guess there's usually a disconnect between the, the, the people who would tell you what LOD you need and the one doing the modeling and mm -hmm. and taking care of the of the model. That, that's why the, these charts are not often uh, useful. Yeah. <clears throat> well, and it is because I've had a few a few times with owners, you know, that will come in and, you know, they need the bins, and they need the Kobe's and they need mm -hmm. the, all of these things. But when you ask them what they want to do with it, most of the time they're like, I don't know. I just Bob over there told me we needed the Kobe's. Yeah, it is. It's just Clients like... are a little confused <laughs> about how to use the BIM data. Like, yes, we can give you this really giant, scary Kobe spreadsheet, but do you know what you're going to do with it? Uh -huh. Or is it literally going to end up on a CD in the drawer next to the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, st still questions about the, what is a live detail as well. Yeah. So interesting questions going to the chat. And uh, Radu Ditcher says, we absolutely need to per classification system data. I, I think he's referring to using LD chart as a contractor. Which definitely makes sense if you if yeah. you're an experienced contractor with um, uh, using BIM at a high level, for sure. Yeah, on the sub subcontractor side, I think it makes way more sense for them because they will be actually sourcing the elements, so they can be putting in very specific models. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think LOD makes a lot of sense for uh, contractors and subcontractors perhaps not as useful for architects and engineers, at least in the earlier phase of the project. Yeah, especially when we're doing a lot of public projects, if you mm -hmm. literally can't spec a specific thing, you know, you have to leave it open. And yeah, exactly. Have two or three choices. Um, and so that clearly makes it harder because if you have something in your model that looks too specific, then you start getting questions on, well, this is clearly a whatever gizmo and what, what if we want to buy this other thing? And just... All right. What, what have you been working on lately? Still more templating? Or any, anything, anything exciting you've been working on that you wanted to share? Oh, it's, it has been working with a lot of clients on templates. Templates mostly, right? Yep. Uh, yeah. How many templates have you have you made in the last two years? Oh, man, I think five or six, and then we've got a couple of new clients for the new year. Um, and then there's there's some kind of continuing work to update templates from before um, and add add stuff in. I know it doesn't seem very exciting, but and I'm actually nerdily excited to get back to the drafting detail component library. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't love spending a day looking up plywood sizes and <laughs> <laughs> all the different spec portions? I know, I know that Brian does. <laughs> yeah, Brian McKee in the chat was mm -hmm. uh, what a session about uh, detail earlier on last year. 
the most exciting thing I've done in the template world. Hmm. See, there's like actual excitement and like nerd excitement. Both of them are good, I think. Oh, that's true. Um, right now we've got a client that, um, besides kind of their more general architecture work, they've got a very specific client that has, you know, they've got their very specific template stuff and they've got their sheet names and their wall types and they, they need to use the pieces from the client. Um, and so right now we're working on ways, hopefully that will be um, buttons on the parallax ribbon that would basically let anybody start a project and say, I'm working on a project for this client or not that client. And it will strip out everything else, depending on which way it wants to go. So I think that will be really cool. Um, right now they've been trying to manage it with a couple different templates and then everybody's not quite sure um, which if they've started with the right one or what they need. So getting everybody to be able to use just the one template and just say, I'm working on project A type or type B and then go from there. It's going to be pretty cool. Yeah, I know for my part, I love one of the feature I love the most in Revit is our uh, schedules. Whenever I've got a weird schedule to make, I get really riled up about it because I know I'm going to have fun. <laughs> Uh, building it, I had a client ask for a strange door schedule recently, and, and that I, I got really excited about it. <laughs> no, define strange door schedule. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's not that strange, but there were <laughs> more information that I, uh, I was used to, and then there were it. It was divided on general doors that were all the door listed, but then for apartments that were grouped together and they had additional uh, parameters and then they wanted a script to automate <clears throat> uh, the door as, uh, not the sign engine, but the, the door uh, right hand, uh, left hand and all of that. So I've been digging about that uh, in Dynamo. There's actually a node by ArchLab that allows you to automate um, that parameter. Or uh, <clears throat> left hand, right hand, reversed, and all of that. So I, I always have a lot of, especially, yeah, when there's a little bit of Dynamo involved to automate the schedule as well. That's when I'm having the, a blast, usually. Yeah, I'll, I'll admit, I when I get into schedules, I do end up a lot of times just tossing most of the parameters in there just to see because every once in a while they snuck something in and you get some great new information that you mm -hmm. didn't get before so yeah schedules are they schedules are nerdy nerdy good fun <laughs> yeah 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 and one client said so i'm having a problem with the schedule do you think you can help and i was like absolutely that's what i love the most <laughs> boy can i <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. All right. And yeah, yeah. Talk, talking about doors, I know you have a, a big doors collection. I've been kind of in the doors, um, researching doors a lot recently. <laughs> and, and I saw you on your website, you have pretty deep, big uh, door collections, right? Yes. Aaron has been lovingly working on doors for quite a while. Um, I, I, I feel kind of privileged that I get to touch the parallax doors. I don't think I've screwed them up horribly. Do uh, you have them in the corner? Perhaps we'll, we'll show that and we'll wrap the show up. We have good, I can find a good picture. I did get to um, somewhat recently add um, divide the lights to all the doors and the frames and trim options for both mm -hmm. sides. And, you know, of course you have to have different trim options for both sides. You can have all the different colors <laughs> because if you're going to do it, you have to go all in. Let's see. Yeah, meanwhile, having a glance at the chat.
Oh, somebody asks, uh, how about cabinets? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I don't like cabinets as much as schedules, honestly. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's always... Yeah, not, not the most fun, but yeah, I do have a collection of it. But it's usually a lot of time to set up. Oh, Jim says, I, I do a lot of kitchen designs. I am a dealer for a great cabinet manufacturer. Yeah, well, Jim, I, I would say you need, you can have a look at the, um, at the default other desk families. They're, they're, they're not great, honestly, but uh, usually you will probably have to, to create your own families. Uh, you can look up uh, tutorials about it, but it, it, it's a lot of work to have uh, good, decent families. Melissa, do you have actually your own uh, cabinet families as well in the Parallax template? How do you usually proceed for that? Um, we do. Parallax does have a cabinet library also. Mm -hmm. Also lovingly worked on for years and years by Aaron. I, I've kind of stayed away from the, the casework library. I have to say it's, it's pretty intense. Yeah, it is. But he's got all sorts of... Can swap out the faces and you can swap out the hardware and change all the materials do all the fancy things um let's see oh that thing we were talking about earlier when you start looking in a folder and yeah, yeah. Before, i just did that <laughs> yeah 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 because be before the show we're talking about how are you well, looking for, for for a file and then a bunch like <laughs> 10 different folders and at some point you're like what was i looking for already and then you kind of move on to something else <laughs> yep i totally know what i'm doing I... yeah if they're too, too far away to, don't worry about it i can i can link to uh i can link to the the, the library actually i think they're all i saw an image on your website Oh, probably. That's what I was looking for the, I, I know we've got them for the website, but I. I guess oh, yeah. we get the website, huh? <laughs> yeah, check this out. So if you're on the Perax team website, you can have a look at the door families if you're interested. It's at the praxteam.com. All right, so we're getting close to the hour. Uh, anything else you wanted to share before we wrap this up? Oh, there we go. There's some doors. <laughs> oh, well, uh, just a second. So many doors. So many doors. Um, uh, I, I just see your other screen, I think. Oh, okay, you, you saw it on my, on, so, on, on my screen. Yeah, sorry. Yes, yes. Look at this. Um, wow, just anything else I'm sure. Mostly that I miss everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we need to uh, get over the stupid COVID thing, clearly, me more than others, and uh, get, get back out there, get presenting and get learning at all these conferences. Yeah, we're talking before the show that uh, there's the, the, the bail conference in Anaheim in in June. Since I'm in Canada, I'm not quite sure if I'll if I'll go. I didn't submit uh, an abstract because of the crossing the border is quite complicated right now. <laughs> but I'm hoping before the, the end of the year we get to, to go to a real conference it would be really fun. I, I miss people in the BIM community as well. Yeah, it's it's been a weird couple of years made a job switch figuring I'd be able to travel and do trainings and see more people and instead saw uh, nobody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would say though, kind of a silver lining, uh, doing the live show has been a blast for me and I've always get to, to meet the, the most awesome BIM people and to interact with people in the chat. So there's, uh, I guess, I, I don't know if I would have started it with without the, the whole COVID thing. So if there's one good thing to come out of it. Yeah, that is, that is true. There are definitely some good, some good YouTube things that have come out of this. 
And oh, and Brian's throwing out the submit your abstracts for built. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it has been extended. I, I saw that. So build for those who don't know, I guess I should present it. The build conference. They always change name though. I'm all, always confused about it. <laughs> the Digital Build Environment Institute, DBEI. Let me show that on my screen. <clears throat> yeah, what we've been talking about uh, real conferences. This one is going to be in in uh, Anaheim. Is this right, or did they change again? No, this is two thousand and one. I don't even know. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you can have a look at, at the website if you want. Interested in going to a real conference? Hopefully it will it will not be canceled at the last minute. I don't think so. We all sure hope not. <clears throat> all right, so we'll uh, slowly close the, the show. So don't forget that next week with Melissa colleague uh, John Pearson, who's going to talk about optimizing Dynamo. He's going to talk about the rhythm package. He's going to talk about the new Dynamo version and how to make the most of it. And he's going to talk about the monocle uh, packet that is used to um, make Dynamo a little more user friendly and efficient. <clears throat> um, so thank you very much, Melissa, and thanks for everybody in the chat. Uh, a lot of really interesting discussion about LOD, about details, uh, and about uh, much more. It's interesting to get uh, your insights from your switch. Uh, from an architect office to uh, Team Parallax. So thank you, Melissa. Thank you all, <laughs> or y'all. So go, go Dallas with it. <laughs> all right. Uh, so see you next week at 3 p.m. next Wednesday. So bye, everybody. See you soon. <laughs>